City First Church, we are so glad that you are here. Just wanted to take a moment to just congratulate so many people that gave their heart to Jesus over the Easter weekend. Uh, hundreds of people gave their heart to Christ, and it's the best decision anyone could ever make. And I know uh, every single weekend people give their heart to the Lord. It's just that on Easter, man, some people are just more uh, receptive to, to receiving Jesus, and a lot of people did. And so um, that's also kudos to you. You invited friends and People joined us online, and, and it's been really awesome. Uh, today, we are kicking off a brand new series called Stranger Things. Here's why. Whenever you give your heart to Christ, one of the first things people tell you to do is that you should start reading the Bible. Now, here's the deal. If you've ever read the whole Bible, there shouldn't be anything in you that says, well, that makes complete sense. There's no way you should walk away with that conclusion. If you walked away with the conclusion that it makes complete sense. You weren't reading the Bible, okay? I promise you that. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says some very, very strange things, like not just love your neighbor. We're cool with that one. That one makes sense, depending on the neighbor. But it also says love your enemy. That's strange. People don't do that. So, so when you're reading the scriptures, there should be something in you that goes, now wait just a second. Now how in the world am I going to pull that off? That's not natural because when we talk about God, we're talking about the supernatural. Now some people are going, man, but I need my God to make sense. But if your God is small enough to make sense, he's not big enough to worship. So there should be something that goes beyond your psyche that, that we, it would take eternity to understand our God. We serve a very, very big, great, magnificent, can't find the words to describe type of God. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, I saw... And we're going to be at a loss for words. It's truly going to be awesome. We will stand in awe. And so whenever we start talking about God, things can get, well, just a little bit strange, especially when we see this specific word in Scripture, spirit. Spirit, because we start going, whoa, whoa, whoa what do you mean? Like Casper the Friendly Ghost? What, what, like what are we, what, what, where, where are we going when we start talking about the spirit, and it can kind of mess with our theology. It can actually mess with our faith as to what we actually believe about God. So here's the question I've been asking a lot of people when we start having conversations about faith. And probably over the last three months, I've been asking people this question. Who or what is the most responsible for what you believe about God? Who or what is the most responsible for what you believe or don't believe about God? Typically, you can point back to a who or a what? Most people, when we talk about their faith, they typically bring up their grandma, okay? They typically bring up their mom drugged them to church. They bring up their background or the church I grew up at. Some people grew up Catholic. Some people grew up Lutheran, Baptist, Charismatic. I grew up AME, which stands for African Methodist Episcopal Church. I did not know what it meant to be Methodist or Episcopal, but I did know what it meant to be African. So, I was trying to figure out what does that mean for my faith in God. And, and at our church, what it meant to have a faith in God meant you were in the choir, okay? We had choirs for every category in life, okay? We had a children's choir. We had a men's choir. We had a women's choir. We had an elderly people choir. We had a young adult choir. We had a divorced people choir. I said, why we got all these choirs? <laughs> Nevertheless... Whatever category you find yourself in, we got a choir for you. Not a small group, a choir. Okay, y'all going to sing songs together. You're going to learn these songs in a hymn. We're going to have matching robes, and it's going to be a great Sunday, and it's going to be open mic Sunday. If somebody else got a song on their heart, they can come up and just start singing whatever. Everybody's just supposed to know the song. Or if you want to testify, you can do that as well. Therefore, that was my experience growing up, and I thought this is what it means to have faith in God. And then something happened. I simply got older, and I started to ask questions. I got older, and I started to ask, what does the robe have to do with my life on a Monday? So it can't just be a Sunday experience. God wanted to do something in my life. And so I, I had to start making my faith my own. And I had a great upbringing, and that's not a knock on anybody, but at some point, 
Each and every one of us has to make what we believe about God our own. Not what we were handed, but what we've studied for ourselves. And, and so when, when it pertains to some of the stranger things that we find in Scripture, I think it's very important that we look it up for ourselves. And I'll, I'll just tell you how I've been preparing for messages lately. Whenever we begin talking about a subject, what I do is I look up that word like on BibleGateway.com. Okay, all of us could do this, BibleGateway.com. You can simply type in a word and say, all right, well, where's the first time I actually see this word in Scripture? Um, I, I was writing a message on marriage the other day, and I went, whoa, whoa, so marriage is God's idea. So let's go to the Scripture first and see where we actually see it to be able to understand how God might want us to view that. So that's what I did for this message. I said, man, okay, some of the, one of the most misunderstood components about God is the Trinity, which includes God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is often the, the stranger part of it. And so I grew up with a decent understanding of a higher being on a very surface level, the concept of a God in heaven. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is how Genesis begins. And then secondly, I believe we begin to understand the concept of Jesus, which really is, is captured really well in John chapter 3. Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. Uh, Nicodemus is a very educated man. He's a very influential man. At one point in this conversation, Jesus calls him the teacher of Israel. He's the guy. He's got his master's degree. He is the professor. He's the guy that everyone's leaning on. And, and Scripture tells us in verse 2, it says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus is a smart man. He hears the words born again and has a reply that you and I would probably have. He says, how can someone be born when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born because that would be weird. <laughs> Nicodemus is really smart. He's going, hey, Jesus, uh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Jesus, clearly you're from God, so I trust you. you. The stuff you're doing, I've never seen before. So, but I'm trying to figure out who you are, so tell me, wh how, 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 does, how does this work? Well, you got to be born again. Uh, have you seen my mom? I don't want to do that again. That's weird. Okay, this is gross. This, I don't want to do this. Please. Is there another way? In other words, what Nicodemus is looking for is a to-do list. Tell me what I must do. She's like, okay, I, 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 let, me, let me break it down for you. Uh, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. To, to which Nicodemus is going, what? You mean I don't? No, I, I said tell me what I got to do because you, you just use the word Spirit and I, I, I can't. How, how am I supposed to do that? I'm just a man. Well, <laughs> which Jesus would go, Nicodemus, you're really smart. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you can't do it on your own. Looks like you need a savior. Somebody that is spiritual enough to pay for you. To which, this is how we get the most memorized Verse in all of Scripture, John three sixteen. This is so Jesus is going. Hey, hey Nicodemus, we want to know who I am. Let me explain how this whole spirit thing works. For God, so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The next time you see John three sixteen, no, it's a part of a conversation of somebody who's trying to figure out who Jesus is. So I think most Christ followers around the world they get the idea of of a God in heaven who's a heavenly father. They get the idea that he sent his one and only son. But even if you were to talk to that one and only son, he would go, yeah, but you can't have me and dad without our spirit. Now, typically what happens whenever we start talking about the Holy Spirit or the spirit of God or the spirit, it's referred to that with three different types of ways in scripture. Whenever we begin having that conversation, well, 
let's just be honest. We all know people, not you yourself, but we all know people who have made it stranger than it already is. And so because they've made it strange, some people have come to the conclusion, well, let's just not talk about it at all. Because we don't want to weird anybody out. Okay, we don't want to weird our friends out. Hey, Ryan, I invited a friend. I told them nobody was speaking tongues, and here you are. Okay, so, like, like, so, so you can have this kind of weirdness about it. But So sometimes we think it's just easier for us to remove this kind of vernacular from our theology because it means something so different for, for everyone. But, but here's what I want to do today. I want us to just look at the Scripture. Okay, I just want us just to look at the Scripture. I want us to look at some in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament, about just how the, the Spirit of God works. Did you know that we actually see the Spirit of God before we even see the Son of God? Genesis 1 verse 2 says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So, so right away, we have this idea that the, that the Spirit of God is with God before we even see the Son. Then, Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, let us, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea. Um, I had a friend who uh, had another friend that, that came to know Jesus, and he said, hey, one of the first things I want to do is I want to gift you a Bible. I mean, his friend is a real academic, loves reading. He starts in Genesis. He gets to verse 26. He calls my friend back, and he says, hey, hey, man, your Bible got a typo in it. He said, well, what, 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 what do you mean a typo? He says, it says us. It's only one God, right? That's what you believe. Three in one. He goes, well, who's us? Which is a really great question. It's the question that we should be asking. And the Gospel of John gives us a little bit of insight in John chapter 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So at, at the very beginning, we have God, the Spirit, and the Son. You, you can't separate them if you tried. And so if you're taking notes today, I want you to see, we're, we're going to look at the three, three instances in the Old Testament. First, then three examples in the New Testament of just how the personality of the Spirit of God works. Just, just, some, just some very, very light study. And again, we would sit here for hours and talk about the Spirit of God and go through every verse. And here's what I would encourage you to do to make this your own. Go home and study the Spirit of God for yourself. And then begin to say, Lord, how can we copy and paste what I read in the Scripture into my life? So the first piece of scripture I want us to look at is Exodus 31, verse 2. It says, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. This is one of the very first mentions of the Spirit of God. And so if you're taking notes, number one, the Spirit of God can give wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of God can give wisdom and understanding. If you've been searching for a job or if you just want a new one, I would be asking God to fill me with his Spirit. Homie just became a graphic designer just because he got filled with the Spirit of God. I can't tell you how many people feel like they have a disadvantage in life. Like life has handed them a bad hand in a game of cards. And they just feel so disadvantaged. And they see all the things that they have not had. They did not have a dad that would teach them how to be spiritual or how to pray or how to worship. And I didn't have a teacher. I grew up in this kind of home. And my dad was an alcoholic. And my mom this. And my grandma this. And, the, and this teacher told me this. And you can just feel like, well, who's going to teach me what I need for life? I got a volunteer for you today. The Spirit of God is your advantage and can teach you things 
that you could never learn in a classroom. I can't tell you how many times, and, and being in, in the position that I'm in, I'm on a stage quite a bit, and so people, um, I, I hate to, I, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble. Some people think I'm smarter than I really am because they ask me questions that they think I have an answer to, and I'm legitimately shocked that they think I have an answer to their question. <laughs> and so some people are like, man, Ryan, we living in the end times? I don't know. Maybe we could be. I, don't, I, I thought we were living in the end times in the 90s. Okay, I thought Y2K. I thought we was going to be gone. Midnight Central Standard Time. But here we are. I don't know. <laughs> People ask me parenting questions. I'm like, I got two little kids. They three and seven. I'm praying them all the way through. We don't know what we're doing. I don't know. <laughs> but here's what's interesting. Sometimes I'm sitting across from somebody. Sometimes I'm on the phone with somebody. Sometimes I'm in the room. Sometimes I'm in the Zoom. And somebody will ask me a question. And in my mind, I'll think, I got nothing for you. <laughs> and then in a moment, the spirit of wisdom will fall upon me. And I will say something I have never thought or said in my entire life. And they'll, they'll respond, man, you're so wise. It's not what you think. It's not what you think. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled, okay? Like, did you just make that up? It wasn't for me. I didn't read that in the book. That's what the Spirit of God can do for your life, if invited, to say, hey, you're, you're in charge. Numbers 11, verse 25, it says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. They prophesied. Prophecy also can lend itself to the stranger side of things because some prophets or prophetesses are a little strange. Sometimes a, a prophet will tell you, uh, hey, uh, what's up, girl? You know you my wife? No, you're not prophesying, bruh, okay? Like, you need to chill, okay? That you don't get to use, they want to use their, like, spiritualness to, like, tell people. It's not fortune-telling, okay? Uh, prophesying is really just speaking God-inspired words. And so how it works in my life is that God will simply nudge me to the left or nudge me to the right. Sometimes what the Spirit of God will do is simply put somebody on my heart to just call and just encourage Here's what I know about you, and here's what I know about me. Every single one of us has somebody in our life, at our job, in our home, at our school, that is currently believing a lie. Yeah. They've been lied to. Oh, they've been told that they were not skinny enough, that they were not pretty enough, that they were not smart enough, that their car was not new enough, that they were not rich enough. And somehow they have gotten to a place in their life where they are spending a crazy amount of energy trying to impress people they do not even like. You know what I've discovered about keeping up with the Joneses? We don't even like the Joneses. We don't even want to go to their house, but we just want them to like ours. And so every now and then, when you and I believe a lie, you want to know what would be great? Is if we had a friend who knew God's truth about us. If we had a friend that could come alongside us and say, hey, here's the deal. God's not like that. God's not doing performance-based relationships. He doesn't need you to perform to be loved. He doesn't need you to perform to, to belong. Let me tell you the truth. Everything, that, all this energy you're spending trying to get stuffed, you don't gotta, you don't gotta do that with God. Sometimes you need a friend to prophesy. Sometimes you need a friend to see in you what you cannot see in yourself. Sometimes you need somebody to, here's the deal. It would be great if we had somebody like this in our life. Can I encourage you? Go be this in somebody's life. Go be the type of person that says, hey, uh, I'm watching you beat yourself up. Did you know you got lied to? I, just, I mean, you do what you want, but you're my friend. You're my sister. You're my brother. You're my wife. You're my husband. I just work hard, but you ain't got to work that hard. Somebody did a lot of hard work for you to be made right with God, and you had nothing to do with it. You should probably walk in that. I, I love 
What it says in Judges 15, it says, As he, speaking of Samson, approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Watch this. This is the fun verse. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck a thousand men. How about that for the Spirit of God? Anybody? No, do not pick up a jawbone and hit anybody today, okay? People are like, yeah, no, 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 we're not leading a rebellion today, people. But isn't it amazing that if you're taking notes, the Spirit of God can give us strength to fight life's biggest challenges. Samson had his, we have ours. And I've, I've watched so many friends battle cancer for a decade. And I just think, I don't know how you do it. Spirit of God gives them strength. I don't know what it is lately, but I, maybe you've got some friends like that. Maybe you're in this situation yourself. But you, I'm talking to a lot of people who've been going to many doctors lately. And doctors are going, we, we, don't, we actually don't know what's wrong with you. Doctors are still trying to figure out what the ramifications of COVID are. They're calling it long vid, long COVID. We're, I was talking to, to, to a couple the other day, and, and, and she, she, she uh, has sensitivity to light and sound now, and, they, and doctors can't figure out what, what's, what's going on with her neurology. It's, it's, it's dehabilitating. And, and, and sometimes you, you've got a prayer that hasn't been answered. And so what you have to do is you have to call on God to have strength to endure. I could tell you story after story of single moms who haven't had to go one on a thousand with a jawbone, but if you saw their 24 hour schedule, you would go, thank God for the spirit of God that can pull them through. So if you find yourself in the fight of your life right now, just know that there is a spirit of God that is available to you today that will give you the strength to endure. New Testament. What we find in Matthew 1, verse 18, this is very strange. I just got to prepare you. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. They were engaged, betrothed to be exact. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. That's strange. Please don't pick up a jawbone and fight anybody today and say, Ryan told me that the Spirit of the Lord was upon me. No, 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 please don't do that. And also, please don't pray that, pray that the, the Holy Spirit would impregnate you. Please, that was for Mary only, okay? That was a one-time deal, okay? That was not, that's not for you. However, what it does tell us about the personality, the person of the Spirit of God is that the Spirit of God can birth the supernatural. Now, there are groups of Christians who who have said, hey, I uh, don't believe in miracles anymore. In fact, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Thomas Jefferson Bible. The Thomas Jefferson Bible, uh, they had created this Bible where they uh, crossed out all of the miracles of Jesus because it disappointed people too much. They would read the miracles of Jesus and not experience it in their life, and they'd just be disappointed. they said, well, let's just take it out. And so let's just make it more comfortable for people so that, but I'm going, hey, hey Mr. Jefferson, um, if you take out the miracles, you're going to take out the resurrection. And without the resurrection, w w there is no Bible. So to remove the miracles and remove the supernatural and try to have this natural book, they're not TED Talks, ladies and gentlemen. They're, not just, they're just not encouraging tweets. We are talking about a spiritual transforming scripture that can change your life and do something for your soul that you could not do for your own. And so, yes, contrary to some popular belief, I still believe in miracles. I've been a Christian my whole life. I don't have a, a BC story before Christ. I have a BC before COVID story, but I don't have a BC before Christ story. <laughs> and anytime somebody has needed a miracle, I pray every time. There's never been one moment where I've said, you need a miracle? Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> well, aspirin, ibuprofen, that'd be great. Uh, 
man, have a great day, man, we'll see you next week. Like, I, I've never had that moment in my life. Why? Because I believe. I believe that the God of the scriptures that opened blind eyes and opened deaf ears is still available today. And I believe that the Spirit of God can still and is still doing the supernatural. So if you're here today and you need a miracle, you are in the right place, baby. Because God can do anything. It's why I do what I do. It's, it, it's why I keep praying. And, 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 some, and man, a lot of times, if I'm honest, I have not seen miracles. But here's what I believe every single day. Today could be your day. So let's pray anyways. And sometimes you're low on faith. And that's why we get on the stage. To say, hey, we'll loan you ours for, for 30 minutes. And who knows what could happen in your life? Who knows what could happen in your home? Who knows what could happen in your job? Who knows what could happen in your relationships? Who knows what could happen in your marriage? Call me crazy, but I don't think any situation is too far gone for God to work a miracle. I believe that with all my heart. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You remember that amazing message Pastor Jared did about six months ago? You don't remember. You remember it was good, See, this is why we all need the Holy Spirit, to bring to remembrance what was said. You see what I'm saying? Now, nevertheless, we see in John 17, verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The fifth thing, if you're taking notes, is the Spirit of God serves us as a helpful guide. A helpful guide, to which you might say, a helpful guide to where? Well, <laughs> I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. I consistently need divine direction. I'm constantly faced with decisions of going, should I go left? Should I go right? Should we go there? Should we work with them? Should we not? Should we private school, public school? Do we, oh, well, my kids, should we play soccer? Or basketball, basketball, thus saith the Lord. You, you just start. <laughs> Got a lot of decisions, don't you? Don't we all have more decisions the older we get? Of course we need a helpful God. Help, yeah, we all need help. Help with what? what? Sin? Have you ever tried stopping on your own? Good luck. Sin will ruin your life. And so, yeah, sometimes we need help to go in the direction that we actually want to go and know we should. I love what Romans 7, 14 says. It says, Apostle Paul speaking, he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Paul, which one is it? Man, you, you, I thought you was a spiritual guy. Now you're telling us you're not. He says, but I am unspiritual, so as a slave to sin. Now watch this. Keep up with me if you can. This is what it says. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do and not want to do, I agree that the law is good. There's a lot of do-do in the text. <laughs> Sometimes you got to make a do with a do, baby. So listen, here's, here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's going, there's a direction that I know I should be going. But for some odd reason, I find myself going this way. You ever woke up on a Monday morning and go, it's salad day. Yep, we're going to get a chicken salad and lunch is what we're going to do. But for some odd reason, the right side of the menu always looks better than the left side. So you'd be like, chicken salad, but a bacon cheeseburger. Hey, what, what is this? Is it? And then your friend orders before you and everything they order sounds like heaven, okay? And then you'd be like, we'll do this next Monday. You know, and you just move. You ever went to the gym? And all you did was go, and you just watched everybody else work out. You was like, y'all look good. I'm going to come back next week, okay? Baby steps, you know? I went to the gym. I didn't lie. Sometimes we have this dichotomy, don't we, that we live with of going, I want to do better. 
But sometimes I find myself going in the opposite direction. We all need help, and Jesus knew it. He did his part and left us help with a capital H until he returns again. It's just that some of us don't like help. Sometimes life experiences teach you that you are all you got in the world. And no one can be trusted. No one can be leaned on. And so you end up in a place where you believe you have to try to make things happen on your own. Uh, If I'm honest, sometimes I try to build things in my house without instructions. Like my kids' toys, I don't need no instructions. Grown man, what you talking about? (laughs) Three hours later, my wife's like, you good? Give me some space, okay? I'm fine. You ever been in the car with somebody? You're like, hey, why don't you look at the directions? I know where I'm going. You lost. You lost, bro. You lost. Where are we at? Man, I, I, do it. I just got to make a left right up here. No, we lost. And, and Jesus is making his Holy Spirit available to us today. And some of us are going, no, I'm good. It's like, why would you make your life harder than it needs to be? It's already hard. Why make it harder? Jesus is giving you a gift. You're like, I want your gift. Why not? It's a gift. It's called the Holy Spirit. He wants to guide you. He wants to help you. And what you need to know is to get this gift. It's not complicated, spooky, or strange. It simply requires surrender and invitation. To say, Lord, Holy Spirit, have your way. The last scripture I want us to look at is 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. It says, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. The Spirit of God can give us divine revelation. Ladies and gentlemen, in the the Old Testament, knowing the will of God was truly difficult for people because the Holy Spirit didn't reside in people's hearts. Therefore, they struggled tremendously to discover what God's plan was for their life. They're trying to figure out, God, which way do you want me to go? And the only way that they could figure that out is if they went to a a priest or a prophet. They went to somebody that they deemed more spiritual than them and said, hey, maybe you can tell me what God wants in my life. Because I don't have that connection like like you do. And so I got to go to somebody else. I got to look for all of these divine signals. But but what what we've read today is that, well, now his spirit dwells in us. And, and, and works in us and can reveal things to us, the mysteries of God, the depths of God, things that no man has imagined, seen, or heard. And, and that word reveal, it, it, the Greek translation of that is simply revelation. It's the opening of curtains. It's something you couldn't see, then all of a sudden, the light bulb came on. And now you understand, and now you can, can see You see, the Spirit of God is in us. Maybe you've heard this before, that God is for you and that God is with you. But did you know that God wants to dwell in you? Let's just say I I were to tell you, uh, hey, um, Michael Jordan is going to be endorsing me. He's for me. You'd be like, okay, 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 I see you. You and endure- yep, Jordan's come to the house now. It's, it, it is what it is. I can't complain. You know, it's like, okay, you doing things. That's the Now, if I took it up the ante a little bit and I said, hey, uh, just so y'all know today, Michael Jordan's here with me today. You'd be like, where? Where he at? Where he at? Where he at? You're like, this, this is levels because he can be for you, but with you is another, another standard. But if I told you Michael Jordan was going to be in me, I'd be in the league. I'd be, I'd be getting ready to play a game right now. I wouldn't be here right now, all right? Because I could win championships. I could go do what he does. Ladies and gentlemen, God's not just for you. He's not just with you. He's in you. I want this to sink in your soul. I want this thing to sink in your soul. You've got more power in you than you know. I think what I'm looking at right now are some sleeping giants. They don't know it. There's nothing worse 
There's no greater travesty that I can think of than a Christian who walks around like this. I, 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 I don't know my power. I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm a nobody. I, I, didn't, I didn't go to college. I didn't, I didn't, I did. I, it may be a strange thing to you, but you got miracle working power flowing through your veins. And when you begin to believe it, your life will be different. You ought to wake up tomorrow morning acting like the Spirit of God is living on the inside of you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is living on the inside of you. Resurrection power is living on the inside of you. Comeback power is living on the inside of you. You pick your head up. Your best days are ahead of you. You got the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. Ladies and gentlemen, when I, when I read just the, the six notes that I shared today that the Spirit of God can give us wisdom and understanding and speak through us to encourage other people and to give us strength to fight life's biggest challenges and birth the supernatural and serve us as a helpful guide and give us divine revelation. I think to myself, who doesn't need that? Who sees all of that and goes, no, nah, I'm good. Really? I love it. So the last question is, how do you get it? It's pretty simple, ladies and gentlemen. Invitation. Invitation. And surrender. It starts with us just going, I'm not in charge. You are. Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. Go ahead and stand on your feet. We're getting ready to sing a song that I believe is simply going to put us in a position that it's simply going to posture us to say, hey, God, I'm available. My life is available to you. Whatever it is that you want to do with my life, you can have it all. Father, I pray that in these next few moments that people will begin to really surrender their life to you and surrender their movements, their life to your Holy Spirit. Whichever direction you nudge us in, whatever direction you guide us in, God, I pray that we would walk in your spirit and follow you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Join us as we sing. Walk with your Jesus.